couple more people wander in. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Sorry, it's a couple minutes late. We have the wonderful problem of needing more chairs. So that's awesome. Thank you all for being here. So my name is Melanie. I'm the adult services librarian for the Appleton Library here. Um, a couple of things I just want to note. There's some really good upcoming programs. Um, if you don't see, haven't seen our November calendar, it's upstairs on your way out. There's a couple of flyers over on this table. Um, this Saturday, we actually have a Find Your Ancestors series um, on saving your digital stuff. So that's a great program, and it can hold this big. So um, Monday the 18th, we have our artist in residence, Gregory Frederick, here, who is doing a giant, large-scale um, mural on our team wall. And he'll be here showing us how he does that process of a mural um, and showing us a little sneak peek of what he's got coming up on the wall. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and both of those flyers are over there. Um, if you haven't been here before, anytime you need to, right outside the door to your left is the Drinking Mountains and the restrooms. Please help yourself. So today, we have a really special guest. We're very excited to have her here. This is Dr. Renee Grelwitz. Renee is a brother, Tom, Indian Nation peacemaker and elder, and professor of anthropology and indigenous studies at UW Oshkosh Fox City's campus. She was recently recognized um, in the proclamation for the Indigenous Peoples Day from the city of Appleton, which was awesome. If you haven't seen that on Facebook, check it out, um, for her con contribution to Indigenous rights. So today we are going to be talking about the 12 tribes of Wisconsin. So please welcome Dr. Renee Grovitz. <laughs> Thank you so much. If, I, if you can't hear me, let me know and I'll swap this microphone for that microphone. I have a bit of a cold, um, but thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate this very much. We're going to be talking about the 12 tribes, but before we start, we need to acknowledge the Menominee Nation, their ancestors, for the wonderful like, job they did in keeping this land safe and whole so that all peoples are able to enjoy it today. I use the word peoples, plural, because peoples in indigenous world, Indian country, refers to everything. Rocks are peoples, trees are peoples. And so it's important for us to acknowledge their contribution to keeping this land safe. It's my family. I'm Renee, the daughter of Teresa and Leonard, the granddaughter of Henrietta Brushel, and she is of the Brushel and Quinney lineages of Mohican people. And the picture in the black and white is a really cool family photo. My mom is one of the, I point to her, she's the one making a funny face and looks like she has a bird on her head. <laughs> That's my mom. She's not here today. Um, but we'd like to acknowledge all of our ancestors and our lineage that brings us to where we are today. I wouldn't be here except for family. We use this map in Wisconsin to give you an idea of the land cessation that our ancestors have given to your ancestors throughout the years. And we use this around circa 1800 because a lot of the indigenous peoples were pushed from the east to the west long before, and my nations as well. We're going to start talking about the ancient history of this state with Paleo peoples. The Paleo peoples, ancient, been here over 10,000, 15,000 years. And what we know about them is what made Wisconsin a place for those ancestors was because of the driftless area. We had a significant portion of this geography that was not covered by the glacier. And so there was a, large, a lot of large game hunting, and there was a lot of land open for food. So this is really the start of indigenous Wisconsin. I wonder, yeah, there we go. There is a, we have a long history in this state because one of the archeological sites, one of the ancient archeological sites is outside of Kenosha where there's this beautiful archeological dig that showed a mammoth being quartered and slaughtered. And so we know that we had peoples living there on a regular basis and hunting these animals. 
We also are the start of what's called the copper culture. And the copper culture, we believe the Menominee, the Menominee people are, the, that's their ancestral heritage. And the copper culture of Wisconsin is one of the largest in that we saw that these people here were metallurgists. They were able to turn and use the metals of the earth into fashioning tools for agriculture as well as perhaps tools for weapons. The other ancient population we have is called the Atsalan, and the Atsalan people are part of the Cahokia Empire. Anybody here at Cahokia ever went down to Illinois for the Cahokia? You need to go see that site, the interpretive site for Cahokia in Illinois. It is this ancient empire built on agriculture, and this empire was on both sides of the Mississippi River, all the way through southern Illinois into Wisconsin, and we think that the Atsalan site was one of their northernmost outposts. Because of the cultural artifacts left behind are different than any of the other artifacts that we have of that era. And part of their empire is they built these palisades. And we know the palisades were meant to keep their enemies out as they were defending their outposts. So it's a beautiful interpretive site if you ever get a chance. It's um, south of I-90. Um, west of Milwaukee, east of Madison. It's a nice place to visit when the weather is nice. <laughs> Another um, aspect of Wisconsin are the numerous effigy mounds we have. And our effigy mounds, and those are some examples, we believe the effigy mounds come from the ancient Suian peoples, um, like the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota. This was their ancestral land. They were kind of pushed out with the Ojibwa when the Ojibwa came in. Um, but the Ho-Chunk, we think those are the Ho-Chunk ancestors. We know they're the Ho-Chunk ancestors because of the stories that the Ho-Chunk have of the effigy mounds are prevalent throughout uh, Wisconsin, and we see a lot of that. One thing to know about the effigy mounds is that they're always sacred. Some have been excavated. We found some human remains in a few. Um, some museums across the state have artifacts from some of these effigy mounds. When I lived in Rice Lake, we had a place called Effigy Mound Park, and they turned the sacred site into a playground for the area. All I wanted them to remove was effigy mound sign from their park. I was not successful in that political endeavor. But these effigies talk about the above world, the below world, the water world, and, and so there are beautiful stories that you can learn from the effigy mounds. The picture on the slide here, that's of my old department colleagues. Um, this man there is responsible for helping Washington County create this effigy mound park. And what's beautiful is the effigy mounds were never meant to be monumentous. They were meant to be part of the landscape and the waterscape. And every year as ceremonies would go on, the mounds would be filled back in if appropriate for those peoples. And a lot of mounds were left to the spirit world, left as they were. So this um, lizard mound park, they're doing their job and removing the leaves in the wind in the fall so you can see the mounds, but they are insisting on not building the mounds back up because it's not their culture, not their spirits. So um, it's a beautiful interpretive part. They have a lot of things to teach. We're gonna start off, when I talk about these 12 tribes of Wisconsin, I'm gonna tell you a bit about their origin stories, their creation stories, because we all have them. We all know where, why we're here on this earth in this place. And one thing to be clear about with origin stories are there's a lot of variations. There is not one story. There's one general story, one outline of a story from which there will be variations of. But in a lot of these origin stories, they'll tell you why beaver has the flat tail. They'll tell you stories on how things came to be. But in particular, I'm just going to tell you on how these peoples came to be where they are. One more disclaimer. 
we talk about the Ho-Chan, they're also called the Winnebago, they're called a lot of other names. Don't get hung up on what to call them. Call them American Indians, Native Americans, indigenous peoples, do it with respect, but most people would be preferred to acknowledge by their tribe. And so the Ho-Chunk people would prefer to be called Ho-Chunk instead of Native American, but you know, they don't walk around with a sign that says Ho-Chunk. Um, so don't get hung up on the, the correct word, because there's a lot of them. So we start with the Ho-Chunk because we know that they are the most ancient occupiers, continuous occupiers of this geography we now call Wisconsin. Their origin story is one of the Earthmaker, as well as when we get to the Potawatomi, the Potawatomi also have the Earthmaker. But this Earthmaker story starts with the Earthmaker being out in space and feeling sad, and he starts to cry and his tears create the oceans, the rivers, the lakes. And as the earth maker sees that this power he has in creating, he continues to weep and he starts to sing songs. And as he sings his songs, creations come into being. And in particular, um, he tried to keep the earth steady because we're kind of off kilter. And so he called upon the four winds to keep things in place. Um, didn't quite work because it was still a little floppy. And then he called upon four snakes to go into the earth to hold the earth down and that was pretty helpful. But then he had to eventually build some mountains to hold things in place. And eventually he comes around and creates humans out of clay. And these humans he creates, creates four of them, and he says, wow, this is cool, <laughs> I like this. And not only that, when he created these peoples that look like humans, when he created these peoples, he said, I'm going to gift you tobacco. This is my gift to you. And when you need me, just lay the tobacco down and say, yo, earth maker, I need you. I need your help, I need your strength, I need your power, I need your wisdom. And so this is really one of the most important aspects of this creation story is the gift of tobacco. In native culture, there are four sacred medicines. Tobacco is the most important. Sweetgrass, and I'll tell you a bit about sweetgrass when we get to it. But the cedar, um, sage, sage and cedar are the other um, aspects of the four medicines. So the earth maker comes down, and in this wonderfully beautiful long story, we see the development of the clan system of the Ho-Chunk people. The Ho-Chunk people have a very strong clan system. Their clans exist today. And their leadership is built on their clans. So every clan has a clan leader, those clan leaders are able to get together and make some decisions for the Ho-Chunk Nation. This slide depicts the massive migration that the Ho-Chunk had out of the state of Wisconsin. So as the settlers and colonists come into Wisconsin, we get the sock and the fox pushed into Wisconsin, not quite friendly people, to the Ho-Chunk. And then we get the miners coming in and it's in the mid 19th century, the 1850s, 1820s, that we get these settlers coming in for the Galena. They're coming in for the mines because it's a beautiful metal of war for making bullets and, and, and shells. And so we get settlers coming in mining, and that's why we get the name Badgers, is because those settlers were digging into the holes on the side of the hills mining, and hence where the Badger stayed. So the Ho-Chunk are in this, they're being pushed around by all sides. They were making peace, sort of, kind of, as best we could with the uh, United States. And after the Black Hawk Wars, where the Ho-Chunk were supporting the Sauk and the Fox, um, the cavalry came in and said, you're out of here. So the Ho-Chunk lose all of their land in the United, uh, all of their land 
in Wisconsin and said, oh, oh, Nebraska looks good. Why don't you go to Nebraska? So they're pushed out of Wisconsin and headed to Nebraska. And if you don't know, there are Winnebago in Nebraska, which are different than the Ho-Chunk here in Wisconsin. They are ancestral cousins and they are related in many aspects. But the Nebraska Winnebago tribes are of a different political entity. So lots of families of the Ho-Chunk said, I ain't putting up with this crap. They get back on trains and, or they walk back to Wisconsin. They're coming back to their family's lands. They were the first people who ran the cranberry bogs. And so they came back and they would live in large family groups and then sometimes get kicked back out and get a one-way ticket train back to uh, Nebraska. But they kept coming back. And eventually, um, in 1962, Wisconsin said, okay, enough already. And they were awarded small parcels of land where those ancestral families kept returning. So the Ho-Chunk don't have a reservation per se. They have bunches of small lands, which is how we get these casinos up there scattered across Wisconsin. Some of the current issues of the Ho-Chunk really deal with asserting their language again. And and I, actually they're effigy mounts too, but I'm limiting it to language. They are working on their language and UW-Madison has created this beautiful Native Nations task force to work with the 12 tribes of Wisconsin, acknowledging them and helping the 12 tribes become back into contemporary history and events in Wisconsin. And um, Aaron Birdbear of UW-Madison Ho-Chunk has really been exceptional in getting signage put on UW-Madison and the Hokak language. And um, actually, UW-Madison has a number of effigy mounds, including Man Mound, which is really very cool if you haven't seen it. Um, and the Ho-Chunk are there helping preserve those mounds and re in, uh, restarting their ceremonies around some of those mounds. Moving on to the Menominee. They too had been long-term occupiers of Wisconsin, descendants of the copper culture people. And the Menominee um, origin story is the most important origin story because they know exactly that they came out of the mouth of the Menominee River, which is up in the UP. They know that. No doubt, no question at all. That is their origin story. It was Bear who came. And in ancient times, peoples and animals, we could just change forms. Today I want to be a bird, I'm going to be a bird. And that's why we, I talk about them all as peoples, because they are, they are bear peoples. And so the bear come out from the underground, and the bear was the first one sitting around thinking, oh, this is beautiful, I like this. And along comes eagle, and bear and eagle become brothers. And out of this, Bear and Eagle travel all the way through Wisconsin. Their origin stories talks about the Wisconsin River, takes us to the Wolf River, and along the way, they develop friendships and relationships where Beaver becomes their sister. And we see that the elk and the sturgeon and crane become younger brothers. It's another aspect of indigenous culture you should know about is everything is related, everything. We don't talk about animals as its. They are peoples. We don't talk about trees as a natural resource. They are peoples. And so all of these have relationships. So it, it helps remind us that you don't treat your auntie bad. You don't annihilate your brothers. You might want to kick them a little, but you don't annihilate them. And so the Menominee origin stories are very important to them and they bring those out constantly in everything that they do. The other aspect before I turn the slide is I want you to notice the wolf. In every, every tribe of Wisconsin, the wolf is a brother or a guardian. And when Wisconsin DNR said, oh, wolf hunting season now, it was, um, it was a stab to the heart of a lot of the people. 
One of the, um, oh, this is the Menominee land cessation. Oh, yeah. So they are the wild rice people. They get their name from the, oh, from the Ojibwa people. So the way a lot of naming goes, you don't get to name yourself too much. It's your neighbors that say, oh, like uh, Winnebago, the people with the stinking waters. That's what Winnebago means, right? Fond du Lac is bottom of the lake. We call the Sioux, the Sioux, which means snake, only because the Ojibwa called them Sioux, the snakes. So the names change depending upon who's writing history. And I put their original names back up. Most of the names that people give themselves are the people. The people of the standing water, people of standing rock. They are all the people, as opposed to the names that are given to them, usually by their enemies. The most significant and most horrific aspect of the Menominee Nation history was the Termination Act of 1954. This was when the federal government said, oh, you don't need to be a tribe anymore. You got money, you got people. We're gonna pay you for your land and say you're just citizens like everybody else and totally deny all of the treaties between nations and sovereign nations. And what that did was immediately put the nation into poverty. They had to find a way to build their own schools. They had to find a way to do health care and elder care. And it was through the work of people like Ada Deer, who was able to rally the people together instead of despair and say, we can do something about this. And it took them until 1973 to have their tribe, tribal status restored. Now it really is significant to have federal tribal status. It makes us sovereign nations because we're not like any other citizen, we're not. We have treaties with the United States that says we're gonna let you all live on this land here but leave the rest of us be. And we can't just deny a treaty. We can't deny the Treaty of Paris which created the United States. We can't just say, okay, we don't like it anymore. And so it was significant, um, and the Menominee celebrate this every year. And Ada Deer is doing a talk down in Milwaukee about her history, I think, no, in Madison on Wednesday or Thursday next week. But the Menominee Nation right now has got the largest natural forest management um, Companies and nations around the world go to the Menominee Tribal Enterprise to look at how they manage their forest. They have one of the healthiest forests around. Their most current and pressing issue is the mine that's going up, the Aquila Mine that's going up in the UP. It is being situated right on, you can see the little star there, right on the Menominee River. They're going to do strip mining 100 yards from the river. The state of Michigan has approved every one of their permit now. The Menominee continue to hold ceremonies because around that river they have some of their sacred sites and their burial sites. They know that's where Bear came from. They know that's their origin story. And so their latest efforts right now is to litigate against the Department of Interior for their lack of judicial responsibility and fiduciary responsibility to the tribe. Because those are on ceded lands, so even though it's ceded, the Menominee do not have sovereign control over those lands. But in the treaties, the United States has fiduciary responsibility to tend to the lands. And so they're still battling that. I give you the website up there if you want some of their more current information. You can follow them on Facebook because they'll do water ceremonies periodically. Uh, my sister who's in the back row over here, she and I have walked on a few of those water walk ceremonies to um, help bring awareness to the river. The Menominee Nation um, also has um, the first four-year tribal college 
They were just awarded the baccalaureate degree. They are now accredited for a baccalaureate degree. They had an associate degree for a long time. But the Menominee Nation, their baccalaureate degree focuses on health. They have a nursing program, but they also are focusing more on environmental studies and environmental issues. It's a great school. If you're hesitant about driving to Kenosha, get this, they have a bus that comes to Appleton to pick people up to take them to school. You can sleep on the bus or do homework. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in awe of that. I love that. <coughs> Potawatomi comes in next because they too have had long-term occupation in this area. But what Potawatomi, um, their earth maker story, they tell a story about those first four humans. And I like those first four humans because, you know, Earthmaker said, oh, let me bake these people, fashion them out of clay, take them out of this oven and say, oh, it's not done. So that, that's, uh, those white people will put them aside. <laughs> then Earthmaker says, I gotta try this again, man. I gotta, gotta get this right. So he does it a second time. But while Earthmaker's doing this, well, those birds caught his attention over there, and the water's running beautiful. He falls asleep, wakes up, it's a drat, overcooked. <laughs> One more time, third time's charm. So Earthmaker does this the third time. He cleans everything out, takes all the ashes out of the oven, get get rid of this, let's start fresh, let's start clean, puts in the fire at um, the uh, elm tree. This is a, it's an important in their story a little later. But he's watching, he's watching real close. I got my eye on that oven. Takes it out, perfect. And those perfect people, of course, Potawatomi. <laughs> So the Potawatomi, um, they, their Earthmaker story is very similar to the Ho-Chunk Earthmaker story. But again, these stories tell you more about the people and they, their values. So if, if you're interested, it's important to read those stories complete on the values. And it then talks about the different clans and how those get to be. The Forest County Potawatomi are called Forest County Potawatomi because they too were kicked out of Wisconsin. Because they, well, it was the um, Indian Removal Act of 1830. That's when um, President Andrew Jackson said, you know, can't get rid of these savages. Let's just push them all west of the Mississippi. Just go, oh yeah, just go west of the Mississippi and all of us real people can occupy and create a civilization. So that did massive damage to a lot of people, obviously a lot of land as well. And when that happened, that had a massive effect on Wisconsin because in Wisconsin, the Potawatomi were pushed out. And you can see on the slide that they had a trail of death. So many of their people died. You know, in US history books, everybody knows the Trail of Tears about the Cherokee, which was very horrific. But um, our school books only seem to talk about the Cherokee and the Trail of Tears. And if you look, the Potawatomi have been spending a lot of their casino money building up interpretive centers along the Trail of Death and leaving memorials now for their ancestors. So a lot of the Potawatomi went to Kansas, and those are the citizen band Potawatomi that are down in Kansas. But like the Ho-Chunk, man, these people said, this is my hand, this is my land, I'm coming back. So they come back in small family groups, and they find each other. And so they, they get labeled being the strolling band of Potawatomi because they'll stroll through different areas of Wisconsin and tell those local villagers that uh, those Indians, get out, get them out of here, get them out of here. Skunk Hill was one of the last places in Wisconsin before the federal government and the state of Wisconsin allowed them to go up to Forest County and have that reservation in Forest County. So they are the Forest County Potawatomi, the ones who own the casino and operate the casino in Milwaukee. Again, cousins to and related to the citizens band Potawatomi, but that is a totally different 
political entity. Oh yeah. You can see the cousins up there. Keepers of the faith, keepers of the fire, and keepers of the trade. The Ottawa are not in Wisconsin, so I'm not going to talk about them. The Ottawa have land in Michigan, the lower Michigan, and they also have um, land up in Canada. Oh, see, I just told you that. Uh, um, and pictured there, he was the last known chief, hereditary chief. Many of the tribes had, um, I don't want to call them monarchies, but they were family lines and family lineages from which leadership came. And they had hereditary chiefs, and he is the last hereditary chief. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 required every tribe in the United States to write a constitution that looked exactly like the United States' constitution where we had elected government. Um, since the um, 1976 Indigenous something, something, something act, the tribes have been able to rewrite their constitutions to make it more of their ancestral lineage and ancestral heritage. Um, so a lot of the tribes have been doing that, but that is the last known um, hereditary chief. So Potawatomi have been busy being busy. They're very generous, and they're very generous with their casino money. They opened up and furnished the Indian Community School, which is now in Franklin. If you don't know what that is, please Google that, Indian Community School in Franklin. Beautiful school. Um, when they first started opening up their casino, they went around to every church bingo hall and said, show us how much you, what you made average in the last five years. And when we open up our bingo hall, if your bingo is affected by it, we will match and give you those donations so that you're back up to what your averages are. They don't do that anymore, but that was the start of building good relationships in a good way in Milwaukee. Um, they are, they and the Ho-Chunk are the biggest casino rich people there are in the state. And though every tribe in Wisconsin has casinos other than the brother town, um, they're not very casino rich as the Potawatomi. So the Potawatomi have been trying to expand in Illinois. And in Illinois, their governor, oh, where's my notes here? Governor Pritzer signed legislation saying that we can have gaming in Illinois. They didn't do that before. Now, Illinois does not have any federally recognized tribes. Illinois is east of the Mississippi and they were very fervent of kicking all of those people west. So the Potawatomi and Ho-Chunk both have been negotiating trying to get casinos into Illinois. And um, as of October 22nd, their latest bid was denied um, in Waukegan. And of course, Potawatomi are not happy about that. But that is some of their expansion that they're trying to do. The Ojibwa people, keepers of the faith, their origin story is all about Kichimanidu, the great spirit. Kichimanidu and Machimanidu, they're both brother, twin brother spirits. Machimanidu is the kind of trickster. We don't have good and evil in indigenous culture. We know people are a little bit of both. And um, some people are more one, like Ichimani do is more of the happy, let's build nice things to help all of the peoples. And Machimani do is the one that says, let's have some fun. Let's see what happens if. So Ichimani do had populated the earth, and Machimani do had just kind of trashed a lot of stuff. And Ichimani do had said, we're done with that. We're going to clear this place out. So we have another flood story. Very similar, you all should be familiar with that. And um, Nanabozo is a big trickster. <laughs> Nanabozo, we like him, he's fun. 
is a big trickster. So needless to say, he finds a way to survive along with some other peoples, like some fish and some birds. And um, so Nanabozo sitting in his log canoe saying, man, this is boring. I gotta get out of this canoe. And he decides, we need some earth back. So Nanabozo tries to swim down to the bottom of the water. He, he's not a physically active guy. He can't do it. He tried, though. He tried. And Loon took pity on him, and Loon says, I'll try. Because Loon can dive deep. So couldn't do it. Here comes Greed, Mink, Turtle. Nobody can get to the bottom to get some soil, except Muskrat. Muskrat is the hero. Muskrat gives up his life, goes all the way down, and when he floats back to the top, as he expired, in his paw, he held some soil. And on that soil, Turtle says, lay, lay Muskrat on my back, and let's put the soil on my back. And through songs and ceremonies of sorrow and joy, they dance on Turtle's back, and Turtle Island is reformed and rejuvenated. <coughs> so thank you, Muskrat, for that. So this story is going to be very similar to Sky Woman's story that we'll come up with next. But it's important to know that the Ojibwa is not a nation. That we talk about Ojibwa nation, but they're not a nation beholding to any other political identity other than their tribe. So the Red Cliff tribe acknowledges and respects the St. Croix, but they don't have any shared governance. They're not going to do that. They never historically have done that. The Ojibwa people are second in population to the Cree that occupied northeast of this continent long ago. And they started being pushed west when the colonizers came in on the East Coast, the Ojibwe were some of the first peoples pushed west. And they continued to operate as bands, as these big family groups who would support each other against enemies and rejoice with each other in harvest and harmony. But they were never had any kind of political entity. And you can see on that slide how much land they used to occupy. Yeah, wow. <coughs> so, um, the first Anishinaabe here, Anishinaabe, I hadn't said that word before, but it's been on the slides. The Anishinaabe are the Ottawa, the Potawatomi, and the Ojibwa, the people. That's what it means, the people. So, um, Bad River, I'm putting them first up because they're their biggest issue now is Enbridge Pipeline number five. Enbridge Pipeline number five runs across their property, and it's the same pipeline that's under <coughs> Lake Superior. It's the same pipeline that's under Lake Superior that is corroding. And about five years ago, Enbridge's uh, contract with Bad River expired, and Bad River said, no, we're not going to renew your contract. As a matter of fact, Enbridge, we want you to remove this old pipeline from our land. <laughs> Enbridge looked to Congress and said, can they do that? And Congress hasn't answered them yet. Because the answer really is no. Yes, the Bad River can do that as a sovereign nation. Because what Enbridge is trying to do is get eminent domain for all of these pipelines. So the uh, um, Enbridge keeps negotiating. Bad River keeps insisting, remove this old pipeline. Enbridge says, OK, we'll run another pipeline through it. What, I, I am a political activist, and I am concerned about the environment. These pipelines were put in the 1930s and 1950s, and they were meant to hold one third of the volume that they now flush through. And yes, there's new technologies and what they do with the oil and all of that other stuff. But the bottom line is, this is very old technology that's lying there. And Enbridge says, we'll replace that line. 
and the Ed River keep insisting no. And at $24 million that was offered to the Bad River, they're not accepting. And um, part of that deals with, they had a flood, no, back that up. Um, in 2017, I don't know if you remember the great floods of the north, the Bad River Reservation was flooded under, and that was the big wake-up call that said we can't have these pipelines here that are this old if the rivers keep flooding over. And so there, on their website too, you can also see pictures that their powwow grounds were flooded 10 feet over, and you can't see their arbors or anything. It's amazing, it's amazing. So the native peoples, the tribes, become partners with environmentalists. Because a city or a town only has so much jurisdiction to tell a pipeline company, no thank you. But they, so a lot of the neighboring towns look to the tribes to say, we're going to support you if you keep doing this. And so we're seeing a lot of environmental coalitions acting up. The Lacoudere, that's how you pronounce that, Lacoudere, for those of you who are interested, lack the flambeau. The Lacoudere have occupied that area as long as they can remember. All of their stories go back that far. They have um, Lacoudere Ojibwa Community College. They have a two-year college. It was the first two-year indigenous tribal college that opened in the state of Wisconsin. And they are partnering, they were partnering with um, University of Minnesota Duluth as well as the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire for some two plus two issues. Get the associate degree with LCO and then transfer to finish your bac baccalaureate degree someplace else. They too, like everybody else, is worried about their water resources. Um, they have the casino in Hayward, if you're familiar with that. In Hayward, they also had that yummy um, barbecue place. What was that? Famous days, yeah, yeah, there we go. That was yummy, we liked that. So the Lac de Flambeau, um, what I really like about the Lac de Flambeau is I visited all of the reservations and spent time there. And on the Lac de Flambeau, when I was walking in the early morning, I'm looking down and I'm seeing, oh, isn't that cute? It looks like a bird walked across that cement when it was wet, isn't that cute? And I walked a little while later and said, wow, that looks like a wolf. That looks like bear. And I'm walking across their downtown area, and then I see some human footprints, and I'm saying, ah. Uh -uh. <laughs> they put those prints there to remind us that we walk with our ancestors every day. And all of those prints in the cement were of their clans, representing their clan lineage and clan heritage. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful story to hear because I'm, I'm mystified. I'm not Lac de Flambeau. And so when I sat and was chatting with an elder over lunch, he told me, yeah, those are our ancestors. They walk with us, Renee. I said, that makes sense. All right. Um, so one of their current issues and things they've been working on is developing a relationship with the local jail. Native American people are incarcerated twice the rate as their neighbors. And so in incarceration, a um, lot of trauma, we could talk about that another day, but to heal a person from all of their ancestral trauma and inherited trauma, they need to have <coughs> ancestral ceremonies. And we know tobacco is not allowed in public and state facilities, and so they're working with the uh, county sheriffs and, and the local jail to allow for tobacco ceremonies, to allow for sweetgrass and drum ceremonies to go back in so that they can create an alternative um, addiction treatment pro program to AA. And that has been working well and trying to reintegrate some peoples of all ancestry back into their, their families. Oh, that's happening in um, Villas County by Lac de Flambeau. Beautiful area. Beautiful area. All right. Now, 
the Sokhagan. People refer to them as Mole Lake because Mole Lake is where they live. Um, the Sokhagan peoples were the ones who put up a fight against the mine. Does anybody remember the name of that mine? Crandon Mine, yeah. And it was their fight, and it wasn't just their fight. Again, environmentalists and the local population, they all got involved. And it's always the mining companies always say, well, it's a choice between a 100% unemployment or a healthy environment. So the mining companies were really adamant about we're giving you jobs, and, and we'll worry about the environment later. But the Crandon, but the Sokhagan people stood firm. They were joined by a lot of other people who stood firm, did a lot of history, did a lot of research, and um, they eventually purchased the land that was going to be Crandon Mine. And they purchased the land because the Potawatomi and the Hocha gave them a loan, interest-free loan, to purchase that land, to make it part of their tribal reservation again. Now the Sokhagan people say, we're not going to promise you we're not going to mine. Because they, we have been miners in Wisconsin forever. You know, copper culture people, we've been mining forever. But if they open the mine, they promise to do it in a respectful way. And there has been no interest at all on their tribal peoples to open a mine there at all yet. Not doing that. So like most of the Ojibwa, they are having language camps and teaching people language. You don't have to be Ojib to go to those camps. You just have to be willing to sit outside for a week or maybe in your truck for a week while you're at these language camps. The language camps usually revolve around spearfishing, wild rice harvesting, or the most famous and the most fun, maple time, which also is cold, right? <laughs> So you're always welcome to their language camps, but again, you have to be interested enough to be ch choosing their websites and looking at them to find out what's going on. The St. Croix, along with the Sokagan people, are the lost tribes. The way these treaties work, if you're not invited to the table, you're not signing a treaty. And if you don't sign a treaty, you're, you don't exist. And the United States got very clever about having treaty locations in hard to reach places. And having treaty negotiation places where your enemies are prevalent. So the uh, Sokagan and the St. Croix, they were not at the table of the Treaty of 1854, and hence did not exist. They continued to occupy the land where they were, and they continued to be part of the local communities. And again, it was under the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 that the state of Wisconsin said, yes, these people have lived here. Yes, they're Ojibwa. Yes, they belong. And so the federal government established some small treaty lands for them as well. The thing to note about the Ojibwa that I haven't mentioned before is treaties call them Chippewa. So they have to have Chippewa in their constitution. But when you talk to them, they are asserting that they are Ojibwa now. They're taking back their Anishinaabe names and doing that. But when they represent themselves in formal business negotiations, they still continue to have to use the word Chippewa. Oh yeah, the CBD for St. Croix. Wisconsin DNR went in and burned their harvest down two years ago. And that's still being litigated through the state of Wisconsin, our state Supreme Court, finding out who's going to pay for that, thank you very much. And the St. Croix are still litigating against the Department of Interior, like, how could you let this happen? This is treaty land. This is sovereign land. So they have invigorated their CBD program and growing hemp. Yeah, burned it to the ground. That was nice. That was nice. All right. I have the Red Cliff standing alone. Have you been to the Red Cliff? Yeah. Have you 
Anybody ever gone to the ice caves? Yeah, that's Red Cliff Land, ice caves. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, what sets the Red Cliff apart right now is they are the first tribe in the United States to create a national park and have it listed as a national park. And the uh, Red Cliff Band, when I first visited them in the 1990s, their casino was a little coal barn, very cold. And then when I was up there four years ago, oh my gosh, they have this most beautiful waterfront casino resort where you can moor your boats on Lake Superior. It is, it's amazing, the amount of work. So the casino rich, the casino money allowed these people to take care of their own people, to build housing for elders, to build health care facilities, elementary schools where they can teach their language and customs to their children before they have to send them out to high schools. And it allowed them to diversify their economy. And so what the Red Cliff did was purchase back ancestral lands that was lost during the allotment era, the Dawes Act, the allotment era, and buy back some of those lands. And when they bought back the land, their intent with the land all along was creating a park. It was not to expand housing, because over 70% of all the tribal peoples do not live on the reservation. And they, the, the nation doesn't want everybody on the reservation because we want the reservation land to remain healthy. We want you to come visit. We want you to enjoy the land. We want everybody to enjoy the land. But the land is now too small for all of their population base. So Frog Bay, is that what it's called? Yeah. Frog Bay Tribal National Park. I went there and unfortunately it was a rainy weekend. We went walking anyway, and I had so many mosquito bites. It was, it, it was not pleasant, I'll just tell you that. Um, but the trails are well marked, and on the trails they'll have um, in Ojibwa language as well as English, and they will tell you stories about the land. How did the land get to be? And uh, So it's beautiful to take a walk and then just read these nice stories as you're going along. They have plans on building that and um, having an interpretive center where you can you know, follow it on your phone or your headsets. Now we're going to move to these Wisconsin interlopers. <laughs> Us New York Indians. Yeah, um, that's me. So the New York Indians come over here because of primarily um, New York said, we're done with you now go away. And so long before the Revolutionary War, one of my ancestors, Sansom Oakum, he was a minister, he was a Mohegan minister, spoke 14 different languages, including Dutch and English and French. And um, he went overseas with LSR Wheeler, who was Episcopalian minister, to raise funds for an Indian school so we could teach these Indians and have them in a Christian school. But when they came back with an equivalent of over $2 million collected, you know, $2 million today money, um, LSR decided, well, we'll build a school, but not for you. So Dartmouth College is built with that money. LSR, um, Samson Alcom, really disgusted, disappointed. Um, he convinces a number of people to Christianity and away from the non-Christian whites and away from the non-Christian, but well, not too Christian whites is the way he words that. So the first tribe we're going to talk about are the Oneida people of the Standing Stone. And the Oneida peoples have Oneida peoples <coughs> in New York. They are the same Oneida. It was Christianity that split the two groups apart. They do not, they are separate political entities, at times they are rivals, but mostly what they're doing now are they are working together and collaborating on Oneida ancestral land in New York and making sure that the Oneida language is being put forward and the Oneida stories are being put forward in New York. But let me tell you about Sky Woman. She lived in the above world. In uh, most indigenous 
United States people, we talk about six worlds, the above world and the below world, the east, the west, the north, the south, and the seventh world is the one we share here. But Sky Woman lived in the above world. There was a lot of people out there and pregnant, craving for foods. One day she was digging roots for her favorite food because she was craving it. And she was digging by the tree of life. Her mother-in-law didn't like that. Don't be digging by no tree of life. But that's where the best roots are. So she was digging by the tree of life. And all of a sudden, this hole opens up. She peeks down and falls in. So she is a sky woman, often called sky falling woman. So of course, when she's ready to fall, she's grabbing onto anything she can. So as she's falling, she has bits and pieces of the tree of life in her hand, in addition to her favorite roots. So she's falling, and along come some geese, some say cranes, some say swans, to slow her fall down. And they're talking, all of these people are talking to the water people below and saying, man, we need something. Up comes Turtle. Turtle says, you can set her upon my back. And so she's talking to all of these people here and saying, well, that was fun. Wow. Yeah, what's next? And so very similar to the other story, all of these other peoples dive down into the water to look for soil. Again, it's Muskrat who comes back. And Muskrat puts soil on Turtle's back. And Sky Woman says, this is nice. And so she starts dancing. And as she's dancing, she's spreading the soil out. And as she's crying because she's lost her family, the, the rivers are grown, the lakes are grown. And as she lays the tree of life down in different places, we'll see that that's how Turtle Island begins then, is with her songs. Her pregnancy, she has twins. It's very similar in lots of origin stories. Happy twin, right-handed twin and left-handed twin. Lots happen between those twins. But now we have the Oneida people. They are called the people of the Standing Stone because they know that's where they need to move next. Every one of these nations that I talk to you about now, they were agricultural people. Yes, they relied a lot on hunting. Of course, everybody did. But they were agricultural people. Corn, beans, and squash. Every one of them. Corn, beans, and squash. So the Oneida knew that this is the next place to go because their rock, their stone would be there. And they'll say, okay, this is where we are. Plant the stone. This is our new village. So they are the people of the standing stone. They are also part of the Haudenosaunee people the Six Nations, the Civilized Nations. And as such, they follow the Great Law of Peace. And it's the Great Law of Peace that was told over and over again. Benjamin Franklin found out that story that's part of the United States Constitution as part of the Great Law of Peace. But the Oneida ended up here, along with the brother town, and the Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican people because we kept getting pushed out of New York. And then they were supposed to go, we were all supposed to go together, one big family, <coughs> to Muncie, Indiana, with the Muncie people. But by the time we walk, thank you very much, walk there, we uh, find that the Muncie people were, uh, their land was taken over in another treaty and they too were being the Inimitable Act, go east, go west, go west. So they end up here in Wisconsin. And, um, oh no, sorry. So with the Oneida people, they end up, and they have one of the most diversified economies of tribes um, in that they have their orchards, they have their, their cornfields, they have quite a few stores. So even though gaming is their um, largest economic endeavor, they have a very diversified. So much so that if you know the Oneida Gate at Lambeau Field, yeah, we like them. The Mohican, Mohican Diak people, the people of the waters that are never still, 
Those are my ancestors. My mother is an enrolled member of the Stockbridge Muncie. We are Stockbridge people because we lived in a village that looked like Stockbridge in England. So the English people said, oh, Stockbridge. So again, this whole name changing business, yeah. And now we're Stockbridge Muncie because when we were in Indiana, the Muncie people had no place to go. Some of them actually did go to Kansas, the Indian Removal Act, everybody went to Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, and some of the Muncie stayed with the Stockbridge. Everybody was welcome. We had negotiated with the Menominee, all three of us, um, Oneida, Stockbridge, and Brothertown negotiated with uh, Menominee for land here. That's a story in and of itself. We won't go into that politics because there are three different stories on how that happened. But um, the Stockbridge, if you know Stockbridge, Wisconsin, well, that's where we were in Wisconsin. We're not there anymore. We're over and the Menominee for the second time came to our aid and sold us land off of their reservation. And so the Mohican reservation shares a border with the um, Menominee reservation once again. So the Stockbridge current issue right now is we just celebrated Electa Quinney Day. Education has been important to the Mohican people long before Samson Oakham. Samson Oakham was so interested in education, he learned all of those languages. He thought schooling was cool. This is great. Couldn't get enough of it. And the Mohican people continue that today. Um, UW-Milwaukee has an Electa Quinney Institute, and it's meant to teach people to be good teachers. So it's all about people becoming educators. And in, um, in particular, they have a significant curriculum built upon educating, not just about indigenous people, but educating with an indigenous aspect to it and doing it that way. We're coming to the tribe I'm currently enrolled in. We are called Brother Town, Brother Tun, because Samson Ogon created what he called Yamkatu Wakanak, a township of brothers. And it's a fellowship from those tribes up there. Those tribes continue to exist out in the East, but again, it was religion that separated us from others. And so um, we are a mutt. We were always a mutt, an amalgamation of different nations brought together under the Christian banner. And so you'll see in our emblem, that's a cross on the inside. It is a spear being planted up and down for peace, pointed down for peace. And it's a peace pipe of calumet as the crossbar, representing the Brother Town Nation. And we are landless because we got kicked out of so many places. We said enough is enough. Indian Removal Act, where they say, get your brown butts over to Oklahoma or Kansas. And my ancestor <coughs> said, you know what's funny? They never seem to let these other citizens go. They don't take land from anybody else. So I'll tell you what, let's ask them for citizenship. Let's ask them for citizenship. So that's what happened. We asked for citizenship. We thought dual citizenship. But with citizenship came property taxes and delineations and other aspects of um, the dominant culture that we were not accustomed to. Most people lost their land. Though they lost their land, we're still hanging around. Over 35% of Mojito, uh, Brother Town Indians still live in Wisconsin around Fond du Lac area. We're still here and we're still fighting to get citizenship back. We didn't know we lost citizenship back until after the 1863 Claims Commission, United States Claims Commission, which was created so that Native nations could claim, you know, you broke your treaty, where's my money? Claim lands. And throughout that process, um, the state of New York, as well as the United States government said, oh yeah, we did steal that land, here's your money. Oh yeah, we did forget to pay you, here's your money. 
And when they came to find the brother town, we got our money, and we were happy with that. But it was five years later, they said, oh, by the way, you're not federally recognized anymore. Oh, surprise. So we've been spending the last three and four decades negotiating with the federal government to get our tribal status reenacted. So that is, needless to say, our big issue. So that's um, the end of my formal presentation. I'm going to do two advertisements and I'm going to open this up for questions. The next talk I'm giving is on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, sponsored by the League of Women Voters at Copper Rock Cafe on Monday. Please join us and we'll spend time talking about the bill that I, I and my friend Lisa Hurst wrote and proposed. We'll talk about that and the necessity and then I also am sponsoring a powwow demonstration. So a lot of people are interested in powwow and regalia, kind of hesitant to ask, saying, oh, those are a bunch of Indians, they don't want to be around. Yeah, we do. We want you to enjoy life. We want you to enjoy the way we enjoy things and share our stories. So I have a powwow demonstration, um, and, and it's all meant as education and a little bit of festivities while we're all up there dancing. Questions? I, I, I got five minutes. All right. <laughs> Please. Um, can you say something about Strawberry Island? Oh, Strawberry Island. What do you know about Strawberry Island? Well, um, my grandmother had a place up in the back for me. And um, when we sprinkled my aunt's ashes up there, my cousin and I took a trip. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Strawberry Island is a very sacred place. Strawberry Island was a place of peace and prosperity. It was where the peoples would go to negotiate and plan. Strawberry Island was very sacred because that's where our ancestral spirits are. They talk to us there. And um, if you don't know, strawberries are shaped like a heart because they are from your heart. And that's, that was one of the things that Sky Woman held in her hand, was the strawberries, at the heart of her life. And um, so Strawberry Island, you can't live there. You, it, it is all meant for our spirit world to be there. Where is it? It's up by Manaqua. Yeah, Strawberry Island, thank you. Very sacred place. More questions? Please. So um, you glossed over uh, Ben Franklin and talking about the formation of our government, but in fact our constitution came more out of indigenous culture than it did out of English culture, didn't it? Yes, it did. That's the Haudenosaunee law of peace. Yes, it came out of, and um, we have a speaker coming for the League of Women Voters <coughs> December what? 14th. December 14th, and she is, she wrote a whole book about that. And, and in particular, what the, our constitution didn't take from the indigenous people was women's rights. <laughs> so, <laughs> so up yeah, after a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's um, part of her, her her book that she wrote about was how that constitution was formed, but in particular focusing on um, what was left out in the great law of peace. Yeah. Who were the woodland Indians? The Woodland Indians are pretty much anybody who lived in the woods, and the woods went all the way up from Maine, all the way across over. It was one a, a, a boreal forest. Um, we use the words, anthropologists created this phrase. So the woodland culture are people who lived in wigwams, lived in the forest, um, used canoes, snowshoes, by the way, snowshoes. Um, so the woodland culture is different. We have the woodland culture, the Great Plains culture, but most of the, the tribes are, well, of course, unless you're Great Plains. So the woodland culture are, really focuses on deer hunting, wigwams, um, traversing the waterways with agriculture as a side gig. Another question, uh, so non-native Well, I love that, absolutely. First 
of all, you know, look for good sources, good books. Um, there's a, a lot of, it's called Oyate, O-Y-A-T-E, Oyate. It's an online, they used to do book reviews to say this is a good book for indigenous sources or this is crap, don't ever use that, you know. Um, so Oyate has a lot of good stories and they have a lot of books that are children's stories meant for different cultures. The Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction has an indigenous <coughs> studies website that also lists lots of resources for K-12 teachers and families and good books to have. But I would start, and then if, if you know the nation, that child's ancestry, I would, I would take them to that place if you can. But certainly have a lot of good stories and look for books that are written by those people. Absolutely cool, good idea. Somebody else had a hand up over here. I used to know. He asked, what is the estimated population of indigenous North and South America prior to colonization? I used to know that. It was part of my dissertation. He answered a special last year. I think they said 20 million. Yeah, it really does vary. 20 million sounds good. Yeah, it, it was phenomenal. Um, the way that I talk about, um, it's really time, so if you want to hear more stories, I got lots of them. Um, <laughs> the reason colonization got easier east to west is because those disease spread first. And in South America, it wasn't disease as much as it was the darn pig. So if you're a pig farmer, you know that pigs eat everything. And pigs will eat the roots of everything because that's what they like. So when the Spaniards and the Portuguese were in South America, they bought pigs, well, so did up here, bought pigs with them. But in particular, those pigs, you can't, we let them go in the forest because it's cheaper that way. And then when it's harvest time, I'll go catch them and slaughter them. Um, but those feral pigs were able to spread through the um, agricultural lands of the indigenous people. So not only did we get some diseases that we weren't, oh, sorry about that, that we weren't able to control, um, our food sources were being decimated by pigs. So pigs, go figure, pigs. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your time. We got one more. Can I just uh, mention the, the December 14th program? Uh, Dr. Sandler, Syracuse talking about the Haudenosaunee influence on the early suffrage movement at the Performing Arts Center. If you're, if anybody's interested in attending, you can go to the Legal Women Voters website for. Can I, can I have you just say that one more time? Okay. okay. Um, December 14th, the League of Women Voters is um, sponsoring Dr. Sally Roche Wagner to speak about the influence of the early, uh, of the Haudenosaunee women on the early suffrage movement. And this will be at the Performing Arts Center. It's a brunch. Um, you can get on the League of Women Voters website, or there's another website we created, Her Voice, Her Vote, Our Victory .com, that will talk about not only that program, but the rest of the programs we're doing this year. And then on Monday, Renee will be the speaker on the missing and murdered indigenous women. Five o'clock. Yeah, the talk really starts around 5.30, because I don't get done teaching until 5. So I'll get there on time. <laughs>